I totally ran out of time last week going through all of the machines in my shop, so this week we are going to finish out the list, and I will tell you if I would buy them again, knowing what I know now. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. This video is part two in a series, going through all of the machines in my shop, sharing my thoughts, and letting you know if I would buy them again if I had it to do over. Part one was where we covered most of the heavy machine tools, so if you want to see that, it might be worth going back and having a look if you haven't seen it already. This topic was voted on by my excellent patrons over on Patreon, so I guess if you don't like it, maybe you should go sign up so that you can tell everybody why they're wrong, but they're a pretty smart bunch, so good luck. Let's go look at some machines. I talked a little in my first video about the space I'm in, what my goals are for the shop, and why that might be different from what you need, so I won't go over that again. I will say that a lot of what I'm covering is hidden in, around, and under other stuff, but I will do my best to get the camera in where you can see. I have my shop air compressor back down here behind and underneath the Grizzly Mill. This is a California Air Tools Quiet Air Compressor. This is the two horsepower, 10 gallon model. Part number is 10020C. I don't think that's really gonna help you because I don't think they sell this particular one anymore, but these little upright, you know, two horsepower models with the 10 gallon tank are pretty common. The reason I chose this compressor is because of the, the noise level. It's pretty quiet at least as far as compressors go. They do have very, very expensive models that are in soundproof cabinets, but in terms of an open frame compressor that's not more than $500, this is kind of what I found that was quiet. Now I know Harbor Freight actually has some compressors now that are pretty quiet. I started out with a one horsepower, the, the little tiny California Air Tools compressor, and what I found is that it just did not generate enough air to run the power draw bar on the CNC mill after I converted it, and the uh, dual nozzle fog buster coolant system. So I stepped up to this. This will run five, maybe 5.8, I think, um, standard cubic feet per minute at 90 PSI, and that's plenty to run everything that I have or envision running here in the shop, as long as I'm not running a lot of stuff at once. If I were doing uh, HVLP spraying, or running a cold air gun, or doing like big stuff and running big air tools, or if I had like, uh, you know, a, an art gouger, yeah, this would not be anywhere near enough. But in my small shop, this is fine. And I actually have it plumbed in. You can see the blue line up there running around the ceiling of the shop, and I have drops at all the tools and this gives me power over at the mill for the power draw bar and a little uh, blow nozzle that I use to clear chips off. This also has enough air to run the plasma cutter on the CNC plasma table, at least the small one that I have, so it's been pretty suitable. Would I buy this one again? Uh, you did see in a previous video I had to tear down and clean out and rebuild the air regulator. My understanding is that that is a pretty common thing with these and that they really just are not that great. And there are a lot of people that have a really poor opinion of the quality of these compressors. But honestly, I've been pretty happy for four or $500 that I paid. Would I do it again? Yeah, I probably would. I probably would buy this again. I might think about getting one with a little bit bigger tank, but in general, I've been pretty happy with this thing. The elephant in the room and the machine that I get the most questions about is this Avid CNC router. This is the 24 by 24 inch uh, Benchtop Pro CNC, though I didn't build it stock. I got just the mechanical system without any of the electronics, and then I put an Acorn board on it and these probably comically oversized ClearPath servos. And I covered that in some previous videos probably a year ago now. And the reason you haven't seen any more content on this machine is because it's still sitting here exactly as it was the last time you saw it. Now I did get a Lista cabinet to go into this base and it was a fiasco. I ordered the cabinet from MSC. They said there was about a three week lead time because it ships from the manufacturer. 
but that three week lead time turned into six months and by then I had other projects in progress and I was distracted and still haven't come back to this. Now keep in mind if this were a job shop and every tool had to earn its keep it would be absolutely ridiculous for me to spend the kind of money I spent on this machine and then have it sit here not running and so there are a lot of people that just do not understand that. But this is a hobby shop and I work on things out here because I enjoy them and I, the machines don't have to earn their keep because the whole shop is bootstrapped. The money to pay for this machine came from other projects that are already completed in the past. When this machine is up and running, it will then contribute to whatever happens in the future. But I'm not in this situation where the machine has to earn its keep or it has to go out the door. So this is a long-term project. I am still working on it. I did uh, just pick up a minimum quantity lubrication system. You can see this is uh, MagLube. I paid for this. It's not sponsored at all. It's just something that I thought would be interesting to try that I wanted to try on the machine because as you can see, this really isn't set up with any kind of drainage. I might want to fix that at some point in the future, but flood coolant is out and even a mist coolant that's going to put out quite a bit of fluid that's going to accumulate. I don't really want that going down onto the Lista cabinet, though I'll, I'll figure it out if that ends up being an issue. So I wanted to try a minimum quantity lubricant system, so that's what I've got there. You'll also notice there's no spindle on this. The plan right now is to use the high-speed spindle. It's currently over on the GO704 mill, and I set up the adapter plate on this. I've also been having some conversations with a company in Germany that has been uh, sending spindles to a bunch of different YouTubers. I'm sure you know the one I'm talking about and talking about whether uh, one of their spindles might be a better fit for this machine, but nothing has been set in stone yet on that, which is why you haven't seen anything. I will get back to this project. It's just a matter, again, because this is a hobby shop, it's a matter of my interest in the project coming back to the top of the pile. Right now, I'm really interested in that surface grinder automation project. And honestly, it would be nice to have this machine already running in order to make parts for that project. But in true Cloud 42 fashion, it's pretty likely that I'm gonna finish that project first and then finish this project that would have been handy to use for that because I always do everything in the wrong order or I end up just nesting dependencies so deep that I never get anything done, which also happens, which is, you know, one of the reasons why this is still sitting here. But in terms of would I buy this machine again, um, honestly, the mechanics of this, from what little I've run it, and you've seen that, like cutting out glass circles, I'm real happy with it. It's really, it's really good. Now, I haven't cut metal with it. I haven't got the spindle running on it, so I don't really know yet. My initial impression is, yeah, this still seems to me like an interesting project. I haven't run into anything that would make me say, oh, this was a mistake, I wouldn't do this again. Now, I really wanna push this thing and try to cut steel with it. Lots of people are telling me that's unrealistic. It might be, but I still wanna try it anyway. And if we try it and, it's, and it doesn't work, we can always do things like epoxy granite or stiffening up these side plates or you know, turning this whole thing into yet another long-term build project. And I honestly don't know if I'm gonna do that yet. It just totally depends on if I get really interested in it and if there's a lot of interest from viewers of the channel. At this point though, I would say yes to the mechanics, probably no to their electronics, but you know, honestly, I don't have enough experience with this to really have a very informed opinion yet. Over here in the corner is my CNC plasma table. This is a Crossfire table from Langmuir Systems. Again, this is not sponsored, I paid money for this. And uh, I set this up originally when I was planning on doing two different projects. One is I wanted to get set up to do a lot of sheet metal work. And that would be in conjunction with the magnetic bending brake that is over on the other side of the shop. And I've done some work with that. I've done some plasma cutting of NEMA enclosures for electronics. And this thing makes short work of quarter inch steel plate. And this is the remnants of cutting out some parts for the, for the stand for the Avid CNC router. And this has worked great for that. 
this machine in terms of plasma tables is not that expensive. This is the small one. I think it was originally 24 by 24, but I got the extension, so it's 24 by 30, or I think it's actually a little bit larger than that. And um, that has just worked great. It's the perfect size for my shop. I can wheel it over here in a corner. It is on wheels. I built a shelf underneath it in a previous video to mount the plasma cutter. So I can wheel it back over here out of the way and wheel out other stuff in front of it. The trash cans normally sit in front of this. I have the coolant solution, which is just water with some borax in it in one of those five gallon buckets. I dump it in when I want to use it, then drain it out and let it dry when I'm not using it. And this has been perfect for my shop. I would definitely buy this again if I thought I was going to do a lot of fabrication work. And honestly, even if I'm not, I probably would still keep this around just for slicing out plate parts. I've used it a few times. Again, it's a hobby shop. It doesn't have to earn its keep, but I have really enjoyed having this in the shop. In terms of bang for the buck, I think it's pretty good unless you're going to go to the trouble of building something completely from scratch. And even then, I think it, you would be hard pressed to do better than this. I do have the torch height system with the sensor so that it will, you know, probe the bed and then monitor the torch height during the cut. That has worked flawlessly. I've not had any issues with that. In fact, I've not had any issues with anything on this plasma table except for the ground loop issue that I talked about with the torch height controller in a video that I did uh, a couple of years ago about that. And once I actually, you know, printed the the plastic isolator parts for this thing just to keep the ground uh, separated, it has been fantastic. I would definitely buy this again if I wanted a CNC plasma table. If we look down here underneath the plasma table, you can see the plasma cutter that's running it. This is a Hypertherm PowerMax 30 XP. And this is a pretty small plasma cutter for a machine of this type. This table, I believe, will handle up to a 60 amp plasma cutter, and this is only a 30. So why did I choose a 30? Well, the reason I chose the 30 amp is because I don't have a lot of power in this shop. Believe it or not, the entire house, including the garage, is run off of a single 100 amp split phase breaker and that is not a lot of power. So putting in the 50 or 60 amp circuit that would be required for a 60 amp plasma cutter or you know a, a, a higher current welder is just something that's not super practical where I am in this location. So the welders, the plasma cutter, they're all sized to be able to run on a 30 amp 240 volt breaker. And Honestly, it hasn't been a big deal. If I wanted to cut out half inch or three quarter inch plate, this would be a huge problem. But really, the biggest steel that I cut is quarter inch plate, and this thing handles it beautifully. Running at 100%, this thing will cut through the quarter inch, and it, it only has, I believe, like a 25 or 30% duty cycle when running at that current, but honestly, it hasn't been a problem. The shop here is air conditioned, so even in the summertime, the machine is getting cool air, and in the wintertime, I run this near the open garage door, and it's bringing in cold air from outside, and it'll run way longer than its rated duty cycle before it overheats. In fact, I've never had this thing shut down. Generally, I'm only running it continuously maybe eight minutes at a time is probably the longest single cut that I've done. And it was, it was just fine. It didn't have any issues with that at all, even though in theory that does exceed the, the duty cycle of the machine. And I did have to wire in the trigger myself. I did a video about that and I had to wire in the sensors for the torch height control for the voltage. Those are not stock on a cutter of this type. So I did have to do that work. If you're not comfortable with that, this is probably not the machine you want. There are lots of plasma cutters that come with you know, torch control systems or control connectors right on the back. The other thing about this one is that it did not come with a CNC head on it, but there is a nozzle shield for their torch, or excuse me, for their CNC torches that will fit on this. And I was able to just buy that part, put it in, and I get a, a CNC style torch head even though this is, you know, a normal trigger style handle that you would normally use just for handwork. So 
I would definitely buy this little plasma cutter again. If I had to do bigger work, I would not. But since I don't, I have small work and I run in a shop without a lot of power, this little dual voltage plasma cutter is really versatile. And I've used it a few times for hand work as well. And I've really enjoyed it. I think it's enough for what I do. It is definitely not enough if you were going to run it all day on a plasma table or if you were going to cut thicker materials or spend a lot of time maybe in thicker aluminum especially. This is the Bailey electromagnetic uh, bending brake that you've seen in previous videos. Um, I did a video putting a control transformer on this to actually step down the voltage because the way these things are spec from the factory, you're not allowed to run them on anything over 220 volts. And since my shop voltage here is 244 typically, that's too high. Now there are people on the internet that say it doesn't matter, you can run these things on the higher voltage, it's not a big deal. And there are horror stories about people who ran them on a higher voltage, burned out the motor, and then were told by the company that they will not honor the warranty because they did not run it on 220 volts. So I put in a control transformer to step it down, and or a buck transformer to step it down, and that has worked just fine for me. Now that said, I haven't used this a lot. Now if you're doing sheet metal work, like especially making boxes and stuff, this thing is fantastic. I have absolutely enjoyed it. Every time I have used it, it has never let me down. I have been extremely happy with it. However, I haven't done a lot of sheet metal work since I bought it. And the reason why is because of Send Cut Send. I originally thought I was going to do a ton of cutting things out on the plasma cutter and bending them up with this brake. But very soon after I got it, Send Cut Send started offering laser, or laser uh, sheet metal cutting and bending and powder coating services and PEM hardware insertion and a bunch of other services like that. And every project that I've come across where I thought I would have used this, it's really simpler and I get a better result and it's cost effective to just send the job out to send, cut, send. And so that's kind of what I've been doing on those kinds of projects for the most part. So this thing has not seen a lot of use. So if I needed to do a lot of sheet metal bending, would I buy this again? Yeah, I probably would. Or I'd check out one of the you know myriad other ones that are out there. There are some that have a better price than what you can get from Bailey and what I paid for this. But the concept of the electromagnetic bending brake is great. For one thing, you can bend apart all the way around and close a box because you can put the bar or some of these shorter, shorter bar pieces inside the box and then sort of pry them out afterwards. You don't have to have the clearance for the fingers of a typical bending brake, a press brake. Or you don't have to have the room for a press brake or, you know, or the typical kind of finger brake. Um, so yeah, it's great. And if you have a lot of use for that, I think this is a great tool. The problem is I've switched over to getting a lot of my stuff from just an outsourced service because that's really convenient for me and they do a better job and they can do things like powder coat, which I am not set up to do in the shop, especially on larger pieces. So I haven't used that this much or this that much. Words are hard. So would I buy this again? I probably wouldn't just because I haven't used it. But if I had a use for it, I still think it's a good tool. To go with the CNC plasma table and the sheet metal brake, I bought this sheet metal spot welder. This is the HTP Quick Spot 2. I featured this in a video a long time ago when I made some sheet metal shelves for the uh, for the going to the plasma table to hold the plasma cutter. And as far as spot welders go, this thing has been fantastic. Unfortunately, it is also a victim of the fact that I have not done very much sheet metal work here in the shop. This is not an inexpensive spot welder. It's the HTP. This is sort of the premium entry in this class in terms of a traditional transformer style spot welder machine. This thing has electronic uh, pulse and timing control and it works great. You set it for the thickness of the material, you clamp it down on the workpiece, it goes bang, shoots sparks, and you get a beautiful weld every single time. And I absolutely love it. 
I just haven't used it very much. So would I spend the money on this again? Well, it depends. If I were gonna do a lot of sheet metal work and spot welding, yeah, absolutely. I think it would come down to either this or building a high energy capacitor based welder, a super cap welder. Um, my friend Andre did that a couple of years ago and that thing is a beautiful machine and he gets gorgeous results with it. But in terms of just doing sheet metal fabrication around the shop and wanting to bang out some spot welds, this thing is easy and it, it works really well and it'll run on the 30 amp circuit that I have for my welders and for the plasma cutter. And so this is a really nice machine. If I needed a spot welder and I had the money, I would absolutely buy it again. I probably would not buy this again today, knowing what I know now, just because I haven't, haven't used it enough to justify it. And again, I blame Send, Cut, Send, right? Because I can just outsource his projects, and so I don't do a lot of sheet metal work here in the shop. But if I did, this is probably still the spot welder that I would buy. This is my Miller Synchrowave 210 welder. And this is actually the first welder that I bought. I had never welded before. That's actually one of my big regrets from my education is that I did not take a welding class in high school. That's, again, the one thing that I really wish I had done that I did not. So I've had no formal instruction. I do weld a little bit um, and that has all just been self-taught or taught by watching stuff on YouTube. I just barely missed out on taking the classes that were offered down in Las Vegas from uh, the fabrication series, the TFS stuff. He stopped offering those classes right about the time I was trying to round up a group of YouTubers to go down and take it. But this is the welder that I started with. And when I say that I started with, it's not like it's that long ago. I'm still not a good welder. I can just, I can stick things together and they stay stuck together and that's about all I can say for it. When I started out, I had grand plans to do a lot of aluminum TIG. And the reason I picked this particular welder is because this is a multi-process welder. This will do DC and AC TIG. It'll do DC stick, and if you get the spool gun, which I got in the package with this welder, it will do um, aluminum MIG. And uh, I have done that on a couple of projects. By and large, though, what I really wanted to do was learn to TIG weld, and that's what I had in mind. And it came down to a choice between this machine and the HTP, the dual voltage HTP that at the time, uh, a couple of years ago, maybe three, four years ago, I don't know how long ago it was, uh, this old Tony was showing a lot on his channel, that uh, HTP, I believe, is the Invertig dual voltage. And the reason I was looking at these two particular machines is because they were both 200 amp class machines, but they would run on a 30 amp, 240 volt circuit. And that's what I have here in the garage. Now, bigger welders or a lot of the other welders in this class specify that they need a larger circuit. They need a 50 amp circuit or a 40 amp circuit. And when you do the math on what they draw and you look at the spec sheets, they can draw more than 30 amps. So technically I wouldn't be able to run them on the circuit in here. Now. I probably could and could probably get away with it, but I wanted to get a welder that was spec to go full current on the circuit that I had. And so this is the one that I picked up. And the reason I bought this one is because the HTP machines were not in stock at the time. So this machine came with the, uh, the stinger for stick welding, of course the foot pedal, the ground clamp, and a torch for TIG. And then I bought another TIG torch that I thought was better. It absolutely was. And then I spent a little bit of time trying to learn to TIG weld aluminum. And what I discovered is the TIG welding is hard. Now, those of you that have done this forever are gonna say, yeah, yeah, not really, it's really easy. Okay, that's fine. But it requires an amount of coordination and finesse and understanding and watching the puddle and having good visibility and understanding what's going on and feeding the wire. And there's a lot of stuff going on that you don't have to deal with with MIG. And I had this idea that TIG was real welding and MIG was for posers. And what I've discovered from actual experience, actually trying to get projects done, is that MIG is a good, effective way to get things done in a hurry without a 
huge investment in learning a new skill. I still do want to learn to TIG and I still do want to get good at that and I want to pick that up and I want to be proud of myself because I'm good at it and think that I'm superior to everybody who can't, but the reality is that I don't have the time, at least not right now, because I always have a project that I'm trying to get done and stopping and learning how to TIG weld is not in the cards for that. I do have a few projects that I have TIG welded, especially in aluminum, that have worked out just fine. And I've got some other ones where I used the spool gun with aluminum that worked out a lot faster and I got, I think, more solid results with less effort. But by and large, I haven't done a ton of welding with this machine because I think I overestimated my ability and my desire to learn to TIG weld. I absolutely could do it, I just have not put in the time, and even when I do, I move back and forth between so many different kinds of projects that I don't think I'm going to have enough time invested over time to retain the skill. So I'm going to always feel like I'm picking it up from scratch. And I kind of have decided that for most of what I do, just working in steel and using a good MIG welder is probably a better investment for me. So would I buy this machine again? No, I would start with a MIG welder, and then if something came up where I really, really thought I wanted to do aluminum TIG, I would probably do that then. But I would have started with a simple MIG welder if I had understood what I understand now. This is the welder that I would have started with if I knew then what I know now. I probably would not have messed around with TIG and it would have gone straight to MIG. And as far as MIG welders for the absolute novice, this is a pretty decent machine. The Millermatic 211 has this auto set technology where you just dial in the thickness of the material, which process you're using, and then set the diameter of your wire and it automatically sets up and manages the wire speed. I don't know any of the details about how it works, but I believe it's using some kind of electrical feedback. It's monitoring the arc and it's adjusting the wire speed accordingly. While I don't know exactly how it works, I do know that it works really well. Uh, one thing to note is it has like an entire range here that says 1.8 inches, or excuse me, 1 8th of an inch, but it, it really 1 8th of an inch is on the high mark. So you set it at the high end of 8th inch if you're doing 8th inch material, the high end of quarter inch if you're doing quarter inch material, and this does a beautiful job of laying in a weld that will stick things together and keep them stuck together. Now could a professional welder who knows what they're doing dial in a welder and get better results than this? Maybe the people who I know who do weld all the time are pretty happy with this machine and think that it does a pretty decent job. And as a total beginner, just grabbing this thing and trying to squirt some welds onto stuff, I've been real happy with it. And the people in the comments on the videos where I've used this say that the arc sounds really good. And I thought it did too, though I don't have the experience to determine that. So in terms of a machine for steel to just get started if you don't really know what you're doing and you are not looking for a big learning curve and you just want to do some things and make it work, this thing makes it a no-brainer. You don't have to do a lot of tuning, it just works. And of course there will be lots of people who have learned the hard way and have that skill set they are going to feel slighted or upset that, that you can just get a machine like this and get pretty good results without a lot of skill, without knowing what you're doing, but that's what it is and I definitely would have bought this machine first if I had not messed around with trying to learn how to TIG weld aluminum first at least, if I had understood kind of what that learning curve was going to be like. Now there is a spool gun available for this, so you can also do aluminum MIG, it's not just steel, but I haven't bothered with that. I actually do have a spool gun that I probably could adapt to this, but I haven't bothered because if I really want to do aluminum MIG, I do have the 210 down there on the floor. Would I buy this again? I think I already said that. Yeah, I would have bought this instead of the 210, instead of the Synchro Wave to start with. It's also a much smaller package, much friendlier for a small shop. I've just got it on a cart here with all of my welding supplies in the drawers. I think I did a video on building this cart and building the bottle brackets on the back. 
And yeah, absolutely, this is a no-brainer. And again, if you've got the money, right? If you've got the cash, this is not at the low end of the price point. This is at the good end of the price point. So if you don't have the money, there's some other options. There's especially a bunch of options now at Harbor Freight that I hear are pretty okay, but this one is a pretty safe bet, and I definitely would buy this again. Okay, let's talk about lasers. I've got several lasers here in the shop that I use for various things. And probably before we jump in on lasers, I should address the safety issue. Um, there are lots of people who have lots of concerns and lots of problems, some imagined, some legitimate about these open frame lasers, whether they're the Galvo fiber lasers or these open frame diode lasers like this X-Tool D1 I have on the wall here. And as I said, some of those concerns are legitimate, some of them are overblown. I'm not really gonna weigh on, in on that. I, I do want to acknowledge that laser light can be harmful and you can be injured, and so you really need to make sure you have proper eye protection However you feel about the various brands of glasses and sources that are available, you know, that's something that you should always be using because you can get an eye injury from one of these things. And there's always the risk of fire when you're cutting things or burning things or getting things really hot. As with everything else in the shop, there are risks and it's something that you need to be aware of. The only reason that I think that's unique on the lasers is that Lasers are something that used to be only really available to industrial customers, and those are companies that had procedures in place to ensure the safety of their employees, or, or didn't, depending on the company. But now that they're available in the consumer market, it's possible to get one of these without really having that industrial structure around you to make you aware of the safety concerns, and so you're kind of on your own for that and you need to educate yourself and make sure that you're comfortable with the safety procedures that you have in place. Now, all of that said, this is the X-Tool D1. This is one of the early 10 watt models. So this was at the pro end before they had the pro version. I believe they make these up to 40 watts now, but this is an offer that they sent to me when this thing was new on the market and they sent this to me for testing. I didn't pay for this. I was just curious about it to see what it could do because they were claiming that a blue diode laser, which is what this is, at 10 watts could mark stainless steel. And sure enough, it can. Not deeply. It puts a blue oxide on the surface. But what I've found this is really useful for, since I'm not trying to burn the picture of my dog into a coaster, is this is really good for using things like Ceramark marking spray on stainless steel. So plasma cutting out electronic connector panels or control panels and then marking those with the, I guess the Surmark spray and burning that in with the blue diode laser works really well and makes a really nice durable mark. Same thing is true on glass. I've used this to make screens for several optical comparators for a couple of different people and that process has worked really well. I'm not you know, making Christmas presents by burning things out of wood. I understand that that's what these things were really designed for, but my use is really more about marking metal. And if you're gonna use something like the Surmark spray, a laser like this works really well. And so the things that make this really attractive to me for that kind of application are the physical size. You can see this thing is, you know, quite large. It's, I don't know if this is 18 inches or 20 inches. It's a pretty large working area. And the other thing that makes this attractive to me is what you can see here. I picked it up and have it hanging here on a pegboard out of the way. I can pull it off the wall, set it up, plug it into my laptop, and burn out a project or mark a project pretty quickly and easily and then put it back here on the pegboard where it's out of the way. So compared to a big CO2 laser, this can do a lot less a CO2 laser can do the Surmark thing. It can also burn out acrylic, which this thing is not very good at. It can burn wood and, and you do all the other things that you would do with a cutting laser that this may or may not be able to do depending on the material just because of the 455 nanometer blue laser wavelength. But the thing that this can do that a big CO2 laser can't is disappear and not take up any space in my shop. I can just throw it up here on the wall. I can pull this out two or three times a year when I have a project and then throw it right back here on the wall. And for me, that's pretty valuable. 
Do I want a big CO2 laser that can cut acrylic? Yes, I do. Do I have the space for it? No, I really don't. And so, once again, I can have that stuff cut out at Send, Cut, Send if I want it, or any of a number of other services that provide that. And I've kind of just resigned myself that I don't have room in the shop for a laser cutter of that magnitude, but I do have room in the shop for a laser cutter like this. Would I have gone out and bought something like this if it had not been provided to me by Xtool? Um, I think probably not, and I'll tell you why. The reason is because I've seen all the people out there that are so worried about safety and having had no experience with a laser like this, I might have been much, much more concerned about that than I am personally now that I actually have some experience with it. The other issue is that the 455 nanometer blue laser just won't do a lot of the things that I might want it to do. It'll cut paper, it'll cut cardboard, it'll cut wood up to a certain depth, especially with the air assist. But I don't really do that kind of stuff. I want to mark metal and most of the time what I really need for that is a fiber laser, which this thing is not. But for the Surmark on large objects, yeah, I'm really glad I have it. Would I spend a thousand dollars to have one of these? Uh, probably not. Would I spend 500? Maybe. So that's kind of where I am on this. I'm glad I have it. I use it occasionally. I don't know if I would go out and buy one unless I had a very specific need. And because the blue diode laser ended up being a little bit of a disappointment when it came to marking metal, at least bare metal, that's why I decided to check out this, the Atom Stack M4. And again, this is something that was offered to me for a review, and I thought it was really interesting and wanted to check it out. At the time, this was being marketed as a fiber laser, but it is not a fiber laser. This is a diode laser. It is infrared. I think it's 1064 nanometer, same as a real fiber, real fiber laser. But it doesn't use an optical fiber as the gain medium, and it, it's only about 2 watts. Though, they're doing some tricks to compress the energy down into shorter pulses, so it effectively is more powerful than a 2 watt laser would be. But a fiber laser, it is not. It will mark a lot of materials. I did a review of this. This particular one, when it showed up, had a bunch of issues that I had to fix before I could even get it working. The build quality wasn't great, though it was pretty new on the market. There are a bunch of other lasers in this class, and you can tell that they're in this class because they don't have a separate module as the laser source. Everything is all just in the head. They work, there's a couple of things to know. One is there's not a lot of power. So this thing is not really gonna mark deeply in aluminum, at least it's not gonna do it fast. It can put marks in steel, you can put marks in stainless, it'll do that fairly well. But anything that's difficult to laser, like copper, it's not going to really have that much power. Because of the lack of power, it's going to go slow when it will work. But it might be an option. If this were down in the $500 range, it would be attractive, especially if you only need the small working area. I think it's like 70 millimeters square. But if you want to do anything bigger, or if you want to move fast and be productive, or if you need to mark difficult metals or mark things deeply, this is probably not the tool for you. I still have it here. It was provided to me for a review. I did a review. There's some videos on that. At the time, I believe I recommended against it just because of the build quality issues that I ran into. But, you know, if you're on a budget and if these are available inexpensively, it might be good. I probably wouldn't bother with it probably just because the working area is so small and it just doesn't have the power to do the kinds of things that I want to do. And the last laser that I have here in the shop is one that I did a review on just recently, in fact, just I think last week, and that is the GWIC G2. Now this is a real fiber marking laser and it has this separate module that has the fiber gain medium in it and the laser source and then the energy is transmitted over an optical fiber to the head. So all the head has in it is the scanning mirrors and the Galvo controls and stuff to, to actually do the marking. The big win for this over something like the M4 that we just looked at is the power. So this is outputting 20 watts from a real fiber laser source. So it's the same wavelength, but it has quite a lot more output power. And because of that, it can engrave more deeply into metals that are easy to engrave 
and it can effectively engrave even things like copper that are much harder to engrave. And stuff like brass, it can actually crater into it and actually get some depth to the cut. The other win on this is it has a much larger working area. This particular one is 150 millimeters square. They also make a 110 millimeter version. And I wanted the 150, so I actually waited six months for them to introduce this before I accepted one from the company for review. And again, they provided this for the review. And by and large, it has been, it has worked really well. It's going to do exactly what I need to engrave these uh, larger control panels. Um, and it's capable of doing quite a bit more. And so this is something that I will definitely keep around in the shop. And once again, if you're uncomfortable with the idea that this is open and the laser is just in free space and there's no guards or anything on this, I totally understand and maybe this isn't the machine for you. If you do use one, use eye protection and make sure that you're keeping pets and other people away from it and exercising the safety precautions that you need to exercise to be safe with this machine. But I think if you do those things, these can be very effective tools and it's really amazing that these are now available in the price points that they're available in, which of course is a double-edged sword if you're concerned about safety, the fact that these are so available to so many people. But that's just something to be aware of and make your own smart decisions about what you are okay with. Now, is this something that I would buy? Well, that I would buy. I didn't buy this one. This one was provided to me. Probably right at this moment, I don't have enough of a need to justify that price point. But I could totally see myself doing it at some point in the future where I have a specific project. Like, if I were going to make these control panels and actually make this as a product for sale and do them in volume, I would definitely want... A fiber marking laser in the shop. I am very interested in some of the higher power units. They have, uh, there are several companies that make them, but there are lasers in this kind of configuration that are larger, that are 50 watts or even 100 watts. And the big win for those, in addition to the power, is that they also have a much larger working area, like a 300 millimeter square working area. And if I were doing something where I really needed to do larger control panels, or if I wanted to set up batches and, and actually engrave a whole bunch of parts in a batch, that's something that I would seriously be looking at. Now, those 100 watt lasers up in that kind of a class are, you know, in the $10,000 range now. Now, that's a far cry from the $100,000 they used to, they used to cost. But if I really was going to be doing productive laser engraving as a business, I probably be, would be looking at one of the 50 watt or 100 watt units with, again, the safety considerations that come with that. But for a home shop, for casual use, I would put this probably in the overkill, nice to have category, if you're okay with the safety considerations of having something like this in your shop. I was just getting ready to wrap up this video and I realized there is one critical machine out here in the shop that I have not yet mentioned, and that is this, the air conditioner. This is a Mr. Cool heat pump, so it is both air conditioner in the summer and heat in the winter. Now, I am not sponsored by Mr. Cool. I am aware that there are a lot of YouTubers that are. They've sprinkled these things pretty liberally throughout the YouTube community. And there are videos all over YouTube of creators installing these things in their shops, in their garages, in their houses. Um, and some of them have disclosed that those were sponsorships and some of them have not. This has been a game changer out here in the shop. I live in a place where there are four seasons. In the summer, it's over 100 degrees, but now it's 75 degrees in the shop. And in the wintertime, it can get down to below zero. Uh, but it's 68 degrees here in the shop, and this has just been amazing. I used to come out at 4 or 6 a.m. and start working in the summer because I had to be done by noon because I was just too uncomfortable to work. Now I can work around the clock. Same thing in the winter. My wife probably appreciates this more than I do because over here on the other side of the garage is the gym, and she comes out here every morning to lift, and when it's cold in the wintertime, she has a really hard time, and this has just made an amazing difference. The tools are exposed to less moisture. I mean, everything just works better out here in the shop. It's not just about comfort. Keeping everything at a constant temperature really helps. 
the CNC mill over there used to skip steps all the time when it was cold in the wintertime and I had to cycle it and cycle it and, and heat this place up before it would run effectively. But when it's climate controlled, you don't have to deal with any of that stuff. So this is easily the best thing that I have ever done here in the shop. And this is probably the first thing that I would buy if I were setting up a new shop. Not necessarily this brand, but to get a heat pump uh, and some kind of heating and air conditioning in the shop. I think that covers most of the big stuff. If there's something important that I left out, let me know about that down in the comments and we'll see about covering that in the future. And if you like this style of video, we could do more. We could talk about the fleet of 3D printers. We could talk about tooling, work holding, storage. We could talk about battery operated hand tools. We could even talk about camera gears and video production if you like. This topic was requested by my amazing patrons over on Patreon. And if you'd like to help support the channel, that really is the best way to do it. Patrons get access to download files for all of my projects and access to the discourse forums for a little peek behind the madness here. Thank you for watching.